Hello everyone, I'm Pastor Joey Rogers and welcome to this very special video presentation from Means Baptist Church. Now if you have your Bible with you, and I'm going to encourage you to follow along with me today, we're going to be looking at 1 Peter chapter 1 and we're going to be looking at the last few verses in that chapter, verse number 22 down through verse number 25. And when I began this exposition of the book of 1 Peter several weeks ago, I had no idea that we were going to find ourselves in the situation that we're in with the coronavirus and the pandemic that we're trying to learn how to navigate, not only as a church and as God's people, but as an entire nation and now the whole world. I had no idea that this week would be the week that we as a church would find ourselves looking at this text. But God is a great God. He's a good God. He's a sovereign God. And he knew exactly the message that we would need to hear right here today, in this very day, and in this very hour. So I pray that your heart will be open, your ears will be attentive, your Bibles will be open in front of you, and that you will follow along and hear what God has to say to us today from his inspired, inerrant, and infallible word. So let's begin by looking at verse number 22, and this is where we're really going to settle in today, to the thought that Peter expresses in verse number 22, when he says, Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another, Peter says, from the heart. You see, we are told in the first chapter of this epistle that we are indeed pilgrim sojourners passing through this world. But Peter pauses here. And he says, let me remind you that through this great salvation that you have experienced through Jesus Christ our Lord, not only are you united together with Christ, not only do you have an inheritance that is undefiled, that is imperishable, and will never fade away, reserved in heaven for you, and not only are, is your very faith sustained by the power of God, not only are you filled with the Spirit of God, but God has not only united you together with Christ, He's united you together with the body of Christ. You see, one of the great gifts that God gives us as a result of salvation is he gives us a church family. And Peter pumps the brakes here and he says, before I start talking about your personal, practical living out of your Christian faith, let me remind you that you're a part of something special. You're a part of the body of Christ. And the very act of being born again by the Spirit of God and God pouring His love in your heart by the Holy Spirit, according to Romans 5.5. 5. Peter says that very love in your heart from a regenerate, a born again, a renewed heart, that love is poured in you so that you can love others. And dear friends, I can't think of any message that we need to hear more right now than that we should love our brothers and sisters in Christ. And this is not some novel idea that Peter has invented. No, the entire New Testament is filled with incredible, incredible imperatives commanding us to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. But here's the thing. These are not commands that are burdensome, that become some heavy weight that bears on us. No, it is a joyful thing to be united together with the body of Christ, to have brothers and sisters in Christ who surround us, who pray for us, who encourage us, who love us, and who uplift us, and then we do the same for them. As a matter of fact, the scripture says in Romans chapter 12 and verse number 10, Paul writing to the church at Rome says, be devoted, be committed to one another in brotherly love. This familial love. This encouraging, loving, helping love that God has poured into our hearts that we might express it one to another. The book of Hebrews, chapter 13, and verse number 1 says, Let love of the brethren continue. The idea is not to let our love for one another be disrupted. And isn't it so easy? <laughs> Many are going to be confined to their homes, and that can create an agitated atmosphere. Many don't know what tomorrow holds, and that creates anxiety and angst. And if we're not careful, we will allow that to build up in us, and we'll begin to lash out, and we'll begin to uh, be unkind to our brothers and sisters in Christ. But we are being reminded here, let your love continue. 
and I don't think anyone says it better, perhaps, than John. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse number 7, when John says, Beloved, let us love one another. Let us love one another. But then he tells us where that love comes from when he says, For love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. So John ties together being born again, being a new creation in Christ, knowing the Lord. He, he marries that together with loving one another. In other words, if you've truly been born again, if you truly know the Lord, then you're going to love your brothers and sisters in Christ. As a matter of fact, in another place in 1 John, John puts it very straightforward. Don't tell me you love the Lord whom you've never seen if you don't love your brothers and sisters in Christ whom you do see. Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 10, I have thought about this all week long. Paul is speaking within the context of sowing to the Spirit and sowing that which is good. In other words, doing good. And he says in verse number 10 of Galatians chapter 6, So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Now, friends, I want you to pause just for a moment, and I want you to consider the end of verse number 10 of Galatians 6. Yes, Peter says that we should be doing good to all people, and especially right now. We need to be looking out for our neighbors, for our community, for all those who are around us. But notice what, what uh, the Apostle Paul said in Galatians 6 and verse number 10, especially to those who are of the household of faith. We are reminded there of the vital importance and the priority of loving and encouraging and watching out for and serving and caring for our church family, our brothers and sisters in Christ. And as I read the text a few moments ago from 1 John 4, 7, let me remind you again that John said, everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. And so if you've been born of God and you know God, of course, John supplemented that with that great command, therefore, love one another. And that is exactly how Peter begins in verse number 22. When he says, since you have an obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. So ultimately, what Peter says here is that you have been born again. You have become new creations in Christ. And as a result of coming, becoming new creations in Christ, the pollution, the contamination that was in your soul has been washed away by the blood of Jesus. You've been made a brand new person. And with that comes... A brand new love. And Peter says, so now it is time to live out that love. It is time now for that love that comes with this new purified soul, the love of God poured into your heart by the Holy Spirit. It's time for that love to manifest. It is time for you to love one another. We're going to talk about what that looks like practically in just a few moments. But I just want to pause, and I really want you to pay careful attention just for a moment. I want you to notice the chain, the succession of events that Peter is describing here in verse number 22. Now, first of all, it's important to note that when Peter mentions the purification of our souls, that supposes that our souls were contaminated, that our souls were defiled, that our souls were polluted. And dear friends, that is indeed the verdict of sacred scripture. That you and I, that all of us, that the whole world is under condemnation. That the whole world has sinned. The whole world has transgressed the law of God. This great and good and holy and just creator that created us, that formed us, that wove us together perfectly in our mother's womb. For we are all fearfully and wonderfully made by the hand of God. And furthermore, each and every single breath that we breathe is a gift from God. Our Lord's half-brother James reminds us in his epistle that every good thing in our life comes down from God. That God is good and God can only do that which is good. And so every good thing, every breath we breathe, every beat of our heart is a gift from this good God. And when we sin and we transgress 
and we break the law of God, it is as if we are looking toward the heavens and shaking our fists and blasphemously screaming, we want nothing to do with you. We will be the gods of our own lives. And you say, well, that makes sin sound really extreme. That doesn't even scratch the surface. The scripture says that we are so polluted, we are so contaminated with the problem of a sinful nature that there is none that does good. No, not one. There is none righteous. No, not one. There's none that will even seek after God. That we have all turned and gone out of the way. We've all sinned and come short of God's glorious standard. And yet, let me tell you what this good God did. This good God in eternity past, before he ever spoke and created anything at all, when there was nothing but the one true and living God who exists in those three co-equal, co-eternal persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in perfect relationship. God the Father knew everything about you and everything about me. Oh, friend, let this resonate in your heart. This God who knew all things, he knew the end even from the beginning. He intimately and personally knows everything about me, which is a frightening thing. Because my heart is desperately wicked. And just like the leopard can't change his spots, I cannot change my own sinful ways. God knew every sinful thought I would ever have and every sinful action I would ever perform, every sinful motive that would drive me to do the things I do, every single desire that would be sinful. And yet God the Father said, before he hung the first star in the sky, before he made the first angel, before he created time, space, and matter, God knew me. And God loved me. And God the Father said, He will be mine. And that's when God the Son, Jesus Christ said, I will pay His sin debt for Him. I will be a substitute in His place so that the wrath that He has earned and the wrath that He deserved can fall upon me. But hold on just a second. Notice I said earlier that I cannot come to Christ. Neither can you. No one can. Sin prevents us from understanding the things of God, comprehending the great and glorious gospel of Christ. And that's where the third person of the Trinity came in. In eternity past, knowing that we could not come to Christ on our own, the Holy Spirit entered that great, what is called the covenant of redemption. And he purposed that at an appointed day, at an appointed time, what we call, what we preachers like to call the divine appointment, the Holy Spirit of God came and he convicted us of our sins. He opened up our heart and convinced us of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He gave us brand new life. He enabled us that we might respond to the gospel by putting our faith and trust in Jesus. What a great and amazing and a loving salvation that God has provided for us so that, just as Peter said, our souls are no longer polluted. They are now purified. They are washed by the precious blood of of Jesus Christ. But what I want you to notice as well is that with this new life, with, when we turn to Christ, our sins are forgiven. We're given a brand new life. We are filled with God's Holy Spirit. And this new life is what we call being regenerated or being born again by the Spirit of God, being a new creature. But I want you to notice how that takes place. Again in verse 22, it's by obedience to the word of truth. And what is meant here by obedience to the word of truth? Well, if you look on down in verse 23 and verse number 25 here of chapter 1 very quickly, he says you have been born again, that God has caused you to have this brand new life in Christ, not according to seed or according to things which are perishable, which, by the way, let me pause and just say that at this point we need to be reminded as churches of the Lord Jesus Christ that we don't need gimmicks. We don't need fancy things. We don't need cool catches to be able to snag people and bring them to Christ? No, that stuff doesn't work. As a matter of fact, he goes on and he says, all flesh is like, uh, like grass and all its glory in verse 24. Like the flower of the grass, the grass withers, the flower falls off. Everything in this world, uh, everything that we know that is created in this world, that doesn't bring people to Christ and that doesn't bring eternal life because it all dies and fades away. So what is it that God uses to bring us to Christ? He uses the word of truth. 
Again in verse 23, he says, that which is imperishable, the eternal, the inerrant word of God, that is, he says, through the living and the enduring word of God. The enduring word of God that transcends every generation. The living word of God that penetrated the hearts of sinful men in the first century and, and caused them to fall on their knees and cry out to the Lord Jesus for salvation is the same living, active, and powerful word of God that penetrates the hearts of men and women and boys and girls still to this day. And as long as the Lord delays his return, as his church continues to proclaim the gospel... God will continue to use the gospel of Jesus Christ, the word of the living God, to transform hearts and lives. Notice what Peter says again in verse number 25, the word of the Lord endures forever. This is the word which was preached to you. So in verse number 23, he references the word of God. In verse 25, the word of the Lord. Again in verse 25, the word preached to you. You see, Peter is using, uh, uh, not to get technical and for time Purposes, I'll just say very quickly, Peter is using a couple of different terms here, and one of them spoke, uh, speaks to the written word of God, and the other one speaks to the spoken word of God. In other words, Peter is talking about proclaiming the scriptures, the good news of Jesus Christ according to the word of God, and that that is the means that God uses to bring us to faith in Christ. And again, this is not a novel idea. As the Apostle Paul, writing to uh, the Ephesians, begins to address the, uh, the Gentiles in Ephesus in verse number 13 of chapter 1, and he says, in him, meaning Jesus, you also, listen to this, after you listened to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, you believed and you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You were filled with the Holy Spirit. You received brand new life from the Holy Spirit when you heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, the teaching of the message of the cross, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ, everything that I went through just a few moments ago according to the scriptures. And again, not a novel idea. Not only did Paul tell the Ephesians when you heard the gospel and you believe you were born again by the Spirit of God, but also in James 1.18 James, our Lord's half-brother, says it with so much clarity. According to God's own will, he caused us to be born again through the word of truth. Romans 1.16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. And again, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word. And I know it is so vastly popular to say things today like, well, uh, let's win the world to Christ. And listen, we're going to go out there and preach Jesus. And we'll use words if necessary. Oh, that sounds really cool. And it plays well on a t-shirt. And it, it, it looks really cool on a bumper sticker. And it makes us feel good about going out and doing good works, which we should do. We should do good works that men should see them and glorify our Father in heaven. But dear friends, the scripture is very clear that God has ordained, God has chosen the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ to save those who will believe. If we are not opening our mouths and telling other people about Jesus, we're sinning. If we are not using the opportunities that God sets before us, if we are not using the multiple tools and instruments that God has put in our hand in this, this unique day we live in to tell others about Christ, if we're not telling them, and their blood is upon our hands. And, but to kind of bring this all home, the question is, what does it look like to love each other? What does it look like when the love of God that has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us, what does it look like when that love begins to live itself out in our life? What practically does it look like to love our brothers and sisters in Christ? And listen, in the midst of this pandemic that we are in, let's put it within the context of the day and time we're living in. I'm not going to give you all of the scripture references. I'll just encourage you to search these uh, scriptures out for yourself. But very quickly, let me tell you what it looks like to love our brothers and sisters in Christ in the midst of the, the COVID-19 pandemic that we're in. How about this text? that says we should bear one another's burdens. I don't know about you, friends, but I've already had a couple of people that I care very much about that have been laid off of work. And I know there's a lot of talk of the government doing things, but if you know the government like I know the government, it may take a while. 
And if God has blessed us and God has been generous to us and our brother and sister in Christ are struggling in any way, don't tell them you love them if you're not ready to bear their burden. If you're not ready to get involved and to help them out in some way. You see, love is more than just sentimental hypocrisy of saying, yes, I care about you. Love is action. Love is, is practically worked out from a heart that sincerely cares for our brothers and sisters in Christ. So when they're suffering, if we can do something, we need to do it. But it is more than bearing one another's burdens. It is rejoicing together with one another, sharing in one another's joys. And listen, the only way that I'm going to get the opportunity to share together in the joyful things that God's doing in your life is if you share them. I, 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 you look at social media right now, Facebook, Twitter, all the different social media platforms, and there's so much negativity and so many nasty things being said. How about you encourage your brothers and sisters in Christ, get online and tell the world about something great that God just did for you. Because what happens in that moment is that your brother or sister who's sitting at home, and they just open up their phone, and they're flipping through social media, and they feel like the world's falling down around them, and suddenly they see that someone else that God loves has just been blessed tremendously by our Heavenly Father. And that becomes an encouragement to them because they say, yes, He loves me with that same fervent love. He gives me that same amazing grace. And it becomes an encouragement to your brothers and sisters in Christ. So we want to share together in one another's joys. But we also want to prefer others before ourselves. We want to think of others we want to put their needs before our own. And that is indeed a struggle for all of us because at the center of fallen and sinful mankind is this great big flashing red light that says, let's live for me. And yet the Holy Spirit is given to us to be cultivating in us a, a selfless love in which we prefer others before ourselves. And that's going to take on so many different uh, so many different personalities uh, just in your home alone. How can you prefer the people in your home right now before yourself? How can you serve them rather than seeking to be served? How can you put their needs before your own? Well, we also need to, and this is a big one, we need to forgive one another, even as God has forgiven us in Christ Jesus. But let me just give you some things again very quickly. We should display to one another, and these are very simple, Kindness. Be kind to one another. And that is so very difficult for us to do because, again, we are uh, in our uh, we are in, in our carnal flesh. We want to be selfish in everything about us. And when other people are not doing what we want, we get frustrated with them. But the Scripture tells us to be kind to one another, to be gentle to one another. And we're challenged to do that, and that is an expression of, of the love of God that is poured into our hearts. And, and with that kindness comes patience. Yes, being patient with one another, especially in this trying time that we're in, and that we would be compassionate and understanding of one another. Something I was listening to Dr. Mark Dever, it's been several years ago, and he made a comment that really stuck with me. He said, why don't you find someone in your life, and maybe they're not the same skin color you are, Maybe they didn't come from the same place you came from. Maybe they don't live in the same social status or financial bracket that you live in. And why don't you, you get to know that brother or sister in Christ? And why don't you listen to them and listen to their plight and listen to what their life has been like and try to understand more of, of what they have to go through and develop and let them get to know you and understand you so that we can understand one another and hopefully be compassionate one toward another. It is so easy to beat up our brothers and sisters in Christ for all of the things that they do. And yet as the old saying goes, you better be very careful if you've never walked a mile in another man's shoes. To know what that person's going through may change your entire perspective of them and their situation. It may actually breed some compassion in your heart, but let's be compassionate. Let's try to be understanding of one another. Let's serve one another. And in closing, let's share the Word of God with one another. Because the Word of God is not just quick and powerful 
uh, toward the unbeliever and it is not just the instrument the Holy Spirit uses to convict us of our sins. It's not just that which declares to us the glorious gospel of Christ. No, the word of God continues its efficacious work. It is from the word of God that we find the great and wonderful promises of God that we have to cling to in the difficult hours. It's from the word of God that we find the comforting words of God that, that saturate our heart with his comfort and his peace and his love. It is from the word of God that we read about the mighty works that God has done and we're reminded that this is the same God who is still working in our personal lives today. So let me be the first. And let me just share with you that earlier this week I was getting ready to go on my morning run. And that's when I had my, uh, it seems like my best time of prayer, just me and the Lord for an hour. And before I go on that run, I sit in my car and I, 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 just, I just pour over some scriptures and, and pray that God will pour them into my heart and help me to be able to pray about those great and wonderful truths of God. And, and I've been going through the Gospel of Luke. And in the 8th chapter, there's an instance in the 8th chapter where Christ gathers his followers and he says, we're going to the other side of this body of water. We're going to get in a boat. We're going to the other side. And so the Lord gave them a command. He gave them a word. And then he gets in the boat with them. And as they're going across this body of water, suddenly this horrific storm comes up. And they're sore afraid and they're anxious and they don't know what's going to happen. Does that sound familiar right now? That they're, they're, they're suddenly their life is just in an uproar? Sound familiar? And then they cry out, Master, Master, Lord, Lord. And Christ was there the whole time. He was just waiting to be called upon and said he was asleep. And of course, God is, is actually in the process in this text of displaying the mighty power of Christ that gets even the winds and the rains and the storms, that everything bows down to its creator. And so Christ gets up and he says, peace, be still. And immediately the storm ceases and the disciples, they are sore afraid. And they say, who is this that even the winds and the rains stop at his powerful voice? Of course, it's Christ. And in this gentle rebuke, he says, Oh, ye of little faith, believe. And friends, our lives are in turmoil right now. But I, I, I hopefully, I can relate to you a very important truth. That if you know Christ, or if you're hearing these words, and right now, if you will turn to Christ, if you will trust Christ, if you will turn from your sins and cry out to the Lord Jesus for salvation, God can't lie. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you believe in your heart that he died for your sins on the cross, that you are indeed a sinner who deserves eternal damnation, and yet you believe Christ died for your sins, and you believe that, yes, he was buried, but he rose again the third day, so that where he is, you can be also. And if you believe in your heart on the Lord Jesus Christ and his saving work, the scripture says that God actually began that good work in you. And just like those disciples, when Christ entered the boat with them, they made it to the other side where he said they would be, even though they doubted, because there's going to be times that we doubt, even though they were upset and afraid. There are times that we are upset and afraid and anxious, even like we're living in right now. And yet, they made it to the other side. And yet there was a point in which Christ stood up and he spoke to the storm and he said, peace, be still. And he never left them. He never forsook them. You see, when God begins a good work in you, friends, he perfects it until the day of Christ's appearing. And that is the wonderful and blessed promise of God that I have been clinging to in my heart because I don't know what tomorrow holds. I don't know when this, when this pandemic is going to, to begin narrowing down. I don't know how much worse it's going to get or how quickly it's going to return to normalcy if there is such a thing. I don't know what's going to happen. But I know who holds tomorrow. And I know that he holds my hand. Friends, I pray that if you don't know Christ, that you'll turn to him. There's a lot of fear out there right now about this virus that's going around. Not everyone's going to get this virus. But everyone is a sinner. And everyone is the object of a just and holy God's wrath. It is because he is a loving and a holy and a just God 
that he must punish sin and hold evil accountable. And yet the same loving, just God punished sin in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, for everyone who believes on him. Will you believe on him today? If you will, if, you, if you've heard the gospel message today and you have turned to Christ, if you've trusted in him, we want you to reach out to us. On the bottom of your screen, you're going to see our website. And you, you go on there and you'll see a, a, a form where you can contact us. And we want you to send us your information, your mailing address. Tell us about the fact that you have now put your faith and trust in Christ. And we're going to send you some free literature, some free books that will help you begin cultivating this new relationship that you now have with the Lord. May the Lord bless you and may he keep you in his abundant grace and may the peace of the Lord be the peace that comforts your heart. God bless and we hope to see you in the Lord's house very soon.